with Laura. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, as Luke mentioned, I'm Laura Grehan. I'm Head of Education and Public Engagement at the Adapt Research Centre and along with my colleague, Emma Clark. We're delighted to have the opportunity today to introduce you to our Citizens Thinkings. Now, Citizens Thinkings facilitate two-way discussion, dialogue and deliberation around between citizens and researchers around the societal implications of emerging STEM innovations. And we'll share with you today how we use co-creation and how it's helped maximise the outcomes of the thinkings for the participating citizens and researchers. So what will we cover in this session? Um, well, I'll start by telling you a bit about ADAPT and our education public engagement programme. We'll then look at what is the thinking and how they're structured. We move then onto the highlights of the external evaluation of the thinking series. And we'll take you through our co-creation co approach and we'll share with you some of the key learnings and recommendations that we have arising from the, the series. We'll then conclude by letting you know how you can get involved, including through hosting your own thinking. So ADAPT, for anyone who's not familiar with this, is the SFI or Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for AI-driven digital content technology. The centre is led by TCD and DCU, but we've more than 300 researchers in a total of eight higher education institutions across Ireland. It's very much a multidisciplinary research centre, so we've researchers across fields including computer science, e-health, digital humanities, neuroscience, ethics and privacy, and, and much more besides. And we secured an additional 42 million in funding last year that's enabling us to work with leading Irish and international companies, and some of which you see listed here. And the broad spread of disciplines and application areas um, of, uh, that you see in ADAPT really reflect the prominence of AI in so many aspects of society and industry today. A little bit about our Education and Public Engagement, or EPE, programme at ADAPT. Well, in 2021, ADAPT was reviewed internationally and our EPE programme was found to be outstanding, which we were obviously delighted by. The ADAPT EPE team then uh, was once again delighted to, to receive a DCU President's Award for Staff Excellence last year, and we won a European Language Label Award for our All-Ireland Linguistics Olympiad in, in 2020. We've now secured more than 1.3 million in competitive funding for education and public engagement process, uh, projects since 2016. And to give you an idea of the scale of our work, we directly engaged more than 40,000 members of the, the public in 2021 alone. And ADAPT has established itself now as a leader in engaged research methodology and practice. Um, our EPE team works very closely with our social scientists, ethicists, educational learning specialists to trial and to share learnings from the application of novel uh, public engagement methods such as the citizens thinkings. So what's our vision for education and public engagement at ADAPT? Uh, well, it's for an Irish public that's actively engaged and involved with the ADAPT research and also for a STEM informed workforce that can leverage technology to exploit the, the opportunities that arrive at the future fusion or uh, interaction of digital and, and real world environments. So we very much consider that we have an important role in both human capacity building for Ireland um, and also in delivering societal impact to close stakeholder engagement in our, our research program. ADAPT adopts a whole centre approach to education and public engagement and our four strong EPE team supports our researchers to drive upstream public engagement with their research. And to help ensure close alignment of the EPE and research programmes, we've dedicated EPE leads in each of our three research strands. And they help us to identify opportunities for engaged research and to ensure strong uh, buy-in from the researchers. As you'll no doubt be aware, uh, AI has become one of the most influential and, influential and prominent technologies across the, the world today. But despite the widespread adoption of AI, questions and concerns uh, persist around the ethical use of these technologies and also around their potential to reconfigure our personal and, and working lives. And Ireland's uh, national AI strategy, uh, which is called AI Here for Good, it places people at the centre of AI-based technological innovation. It prioritises the role played by citizens and other members of society in developing an understanding and trust in the potential of AI. But despite this, there's been very few um, attempts in Ireland to engage the public with the societal and ethical implications of deploying AI systems across the public and private sectors. And there's a clear need for public dialogue initiatives uh, that create opportunities for discussion around AI development and use in Ireland. 
And in response to this need, uh, ADAPT launched Discuss AI last year. And this is a program of interactive um, public events and resources that enable the Irish public to learn uh, about AI and to acquire relevant skills, to participate in a national conversation on AI, and importantly, to have a voice on the, the, the future of this vital area of research. Uh, Discuss AI last year contributed to the government's Creating Our Future uh, which campaign, which was a national conversation on research in Ireland. And it invited members of the public to submit their ideas for research. And from the more than 18,000 research ideas submitted to, to Creating Our Future, safeguarding trust and privacy in the digital world was one of the main themes that emerged. And our, our citizens' thinkings were at the heart of the ADAPT, uh, or are at the heart of the ADAPT Discuss AI campaign. So to introduce you to the concept of a thinking and what they aim to achieve, we've put together a short video, uh, which we'll show you now. I'm Dr. Emma Clark from the ADAPT Education and Public Engagement Team. Together with other members of the ADAPT team, we run the Discuss AI Citizens Thinking series. ADAPT is the Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for AI-driven digital content technology. Our Citizens Thinkings engage Irish adults in discussion, dialogue and deliberation around the societal implications of artificial intelligence, one of the most impactful innovations of our times. ADAPT's research in AI has the potential to transform people's lifestyles, so it's vital to empower individuals to have their say on the wider development and use of AI. The Thinking series generates two-way dialogue between scientists and the public to empower people as scientific citizens. Through the Thinkings, we aim to enhance participants' understanding of AI and its potential impact on their lives and on society. Strengthen both the citizens' and the scientists' familiarity with diverse points of view related to AI and grow people's confidence in participating in public discourse about STEM. Thinkings are developed and delivered by ADAPT researchers in collaboration with industry and community partners. We have also worked with the Irish Department of Education to deliver thinking workshops for teachers of STEAM subjects. Each thinking begins with a short introduction to AI in society. This is followed by small group discussion of technology application scenarios, focusing on the possible opportunities, impacts, risks and benefits of the emerging technology. At the end of the discussion, each small group reports their thoughts and recommendations and the whole group reflects and deliberates on the overall ideas. Thinking discussion scenarios focus on aspects of AI, ethics, privacy and civil liberties. ADAPT researchers co-create discussion scenarios with target participant groups to ensure that they're engaging, thought-provoking and relevant to their daily lives. Past thinking scenario topics include discussions about health information, data privacy and smart home technology. Thinkings were initially designed and tested through in-person events. However, we've also delivered thinkings online and in hybrid mode. Evaluation of the in-person and the online thinkings reveals that the scenarios help people to engage with STEM research and participants feel more confident discussing STEM topics afterwards. Contributors find that their understanding of the potential impact of AI on their lives and on society is improved by attending. Participants enjoy the events. Researchers find that the insights and feedback from public participants are relevant, inspiring valuable and useful. ADAPT will continue to collaborate with stakeholders from community and civil organisations, industry and government to encourage other organisations to leverage the thinking format to foster discussion, dialogue and deliberation around the societal implications of emerging science and technology. 
If you are interested in collaborating with us or hosting your own thinking, the Adapt Thinking website contains information and resources, including evaluation reports, discussion scenarios, and thinking hosting guidelines. Follow us at Discuss AI on Twitter and Instagram and sign up for our mailing list at thinkins.adaptcenter.ie. So I hope the video gives you a flavour for, for what the, the citizens think ins are. Uh, just to recap, um, they're designed to foster discussion, dialogue and deliberation around the societal implications of emerging STEM innovation, and in our case this is around AI. They facilitate informed debate on the, the role of, of STEM in our lives, and aim to make citizens feel more engaged with and have their say on STEM issues. They also make our researchers more familiar with public views on their work, and the thinking themes focus on aspects of AI, ethics and privacy. And importantly, the thinkings have been funded by SFI's Science Week and SFI Discover Programme calls. So the thinkings commence with an, an introductory presentation on the theme of the thinking, so the public participants can engage in forum debate on the, pro on the, the topic. We then have small group discussions uh, on one or two uh, discussion scenarios related to the use of the technology in question. And each breakout group then reports their main thoughts, concerns, ideas and so on back to the whole group. And we wrap up then with a further whole, whole group discussion, um, reflection and deliberation. So what kind of scenarios have we discussed at the Think Ins? Well, here you see some of the themes that we've addressed, including the use of AI in the homes for things like smart doorbells and voice assistants, AI enabled surveillance systems and access to health information. And Emma will outline shortly that these scenarios are co-created with stakeholders to ensure that they're of interest to and they resonate with the, the target audience. ADAPT hosted its first Think In in 2019, in November 2019, and the Think Ins were originally conceived for in-person delivery. But of course, the pandemic prompted us to explore uh, other delivery options. The in-person Think Ins usually last two to two and a half hours and attract uh, usually 30 to 50 people, depending on the, the size of the venue. And we typically host the Think Ins in the heart of communities, so venues such as public libraries and community outreach centres. We moved the Think Ins online in mid 2020, hosting them on Zoom and using breakout rooms for the small group discussions. And this worked well for us, but we shortened down the duration to about one and a half hours and reduced the number of our, our participants to about 20, as we found this was kind of around the sweet spot for online engagement. And then there's the hybrid format. So this is definitely the most time consuming and resource intensive of the, the three formats we've used so far. But a good example of how we structured the hybrid thinkings is the thinking that we ran for Science Week in November last year. Uh, we used it alone as the national hub for that thinking and held simultaneous in-person thinkings in Dublin and Cork, as well as an online thinking. And we used an, the uh, instead of the we used an interview style for the expert introduction rather than our, our usual presentation. Um, and this interview was broadcast then to all of the thinking locations. Um, each location then carried out a small group scenario discussion and they reported back kind of Eurovision style to, to all of the locations and that we found that the, the format worked very well for us. We found that a really good MC is vital for a hybrid thinking and for us we were lucky to have um, Ronan Berry who was the host of the talking business show on Midlands Radio. He acted as co uh, MC for us. And you also, I should ideally have someone with expertise in video conferencing uh, for these hybrid events. And for this one, we hired, hired in an external audio visual company. And you can see on the, the top right here, um, their setup. So who participates in the Think Ins? Well, to date, we've had more than 500 citizens and over 120 researchers have participated in 21 Think Ins. And they're primarily targeted at adults. And in, in fact, the SFI Discover Programme call that is, is, is funding our current se series uh, is encouraging us to engage adults aged 18 to 55 in particular. And we've also run thinkings for teachers in collaboration with the Department of Education and for teenagers as part of our wider youth programmes that we offer. So let's look briefly at the main findings of the external evaluation of the thinking series. The external evaluation was carried out by the Institute of Methods Innovation using pre and post event surveys. 
And the evaluation asked citizens firstly uh, what their main reasons were for attending a think here, thinking. And you can see here that education and the opportunity to learn about research were the primary motivators, and less so the chance to meet researchers or, uh, or, and, and for entertainment purposes. The evaluation asked citizens, both before and after the thinking, how familiar they were with the concept of AI. And you can see here that their familiarity increased. There's a drop of 10% in the number of people who said that they were not at all or only slightly familiar with AI, and an increase of 20% in the number of people who said that they were now moderately or extremely familiar with the concept of AI. The evaluation then looked at citizens' attitudes to AI research. They're asked to in indicate their attitudes on a variety of factors, and this was on a scale from a negative minus three or deep red uh, through to positive plus three or, or dark green. And the change in attitudes from pre to post event is indicated on the, the right of the screen. We found positive changes in participating citizens' views of AI research as being fascinating, interesting and beneficial. But we found, in fact, that citizens were less likely, likely to consider AI research as trustworthy post event. And this for us was a really interesting finding, as you'll see in a moment, that they found AI researchers more trustworthy post event, but not necessarily the research. And there is also a slightly negative change in participants seeing AI as useful. Uh, again, this to us was interesting because there was a positive shift in participants viewing research as helping with the problems, the real problems of ordinary people post event. The evaluation also looked at the workshop experience for public participants and again using the scale from strongly disagree in dark green through to strongly disagree in dark red. The majority of people felt that their contribution to the thinking was valued. Uh, the vast majority or 83% either agreed or strongly agreed that they participated actively in the event and almost everyone enjoyed it. Uh, almost nobody found the thinking event confusing, thankfully. Um, we had over 70% who disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement that they were uncomfortable asking questions, and a further 18% said that they somewhat disagreed. So I think this highlights that the, the thinking is really provide an environment for open and frank discussion. Very few people were uh, disappointed with the event, and the majority found that uh, felt that the event was a, a good use of their time. In terms of immediate outcomes post event, the thinking prompted many public participants to continue the conversation beyond the event. And this is with, for example, family, colleagues, or friends, um, and also prompted them to seek more information on the topic or to take another follow up action. And this indicates that the thinking, I think, really got them thinking about, about aspects of AI. So that's what the evaluation found about the experience and outcomes for the public participants, which on the whole are very positive. Uh, we think that there are some very interesting findings for us to investigate current uh, further in the upcoming series of thinking. So, for example, why the thinkings made participating citizens less likely to trust AI research, but more likely to trust AI researchers, and why the citizens felt that AI research was less useful, but felt more positively that research is helping with the real problems of ordinary people. Um, but what about our researchers' experiences? Well, the evaluation asked them to indicate their attitudes, again, on a scale from minus three to plus three on a range of factors. They generally found that it was an easy format for public engagement, uh, and we had a positive change of 26% there. Um, and all of the researchers agreed or strongly agreed that it's a useful format for public engagement, and all agreed again that it, that it was fun. Another positive shift was that the researchers all agreed post event that the general public should have a say in how research develops, and this was up from 77% pre event. The researchers disagreed with the statement that it was difficult to engage uh, with event participants, and we saw this reflected in the thinkings where there were lively discussions between the researchers and the citizens. And in fact, 89% of participating researchers at least somewhat agreed that the thinking was, an, was the ideal uh, format for, for engaging with people from the public. Uh, only 11% is somewhat disagreeing with this statement. And finally, the evaluators asked the researchers post event to rate their experience of the thinking. Uh, all of the researchers agreed or strongly agreed that the feedback they received from the public, uh, and that is the opinions and ideas uh, that they got from the public participants, were relevant and valuable. Uh, they rated it positively in terms of usefulness, 
um, and also rated the feedback um, positively in terms of it being inspiring. Um, and you can see the full uh, presentation of the full evaluation findings from the project uh, by lead evaluator Dr. Eric Jensen on our Thinking microsite, which is thinkings.adaptcentre.ie. Uh, so I'm going to hold, uh, pass you over now to Emma, and she's going to take us through the thinking process uh, on how we build co-creation into it. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> so I'll just take a second here to... Um, just trying to stop share. I, I think it. I stopped here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pick up there where Laura left off. Um, Sorry, this is a small bit slow. Am I sharing? You are indeed. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, so um, so I'm going to take over there where Laura left off, and um, I'm going to bring you through a kind of a almost like a, a case study of one of our thinkings that we that we ran last year. Um, so Laura actually showed this slide earlier um, around the thinkings that we ran, the topics that we ran last year, and I'm going to um, look at. The, this particular one, um, which was entitled, What is My Health Information? Um, so um, I'll, in, over the next few minutes, I'm going to go through this, how this thinking process kind of worked in action and basically how we went from an idea for a topic to concrete outputs that have that have been used to kickstart conversations in, in this area. So in ADAPT, um, health is a key component of the research program. And there are lots, a lot of interdisciplinary researchers looking at how engaging with digital technologies can, can affect our health and well-being. And health information specifically is the information, the, the information that exists about an individual, which may be relevant um, to decisions that are made about their current or future health or illness. And many countries have an electronic health record system, which is like a digital version of the GP's file. Um, and any you know, consultant visits come into your GP and it's all contained in one file. Um, but, but here in Ireland, we, we still don't have a digitally connected health service. So it's a lot more challenging for people to access their electronic health record. So how this topic came about was um, it, it came about against the backdrop of emerging policy discussions in this area about electronic health records um, and ADAPT's researchers who work in this area have an ongoing partnership with IPOSI, which is the Irish platform for patient organisations, science and industry and also have ongoing partnerships with patient and citizen groups. Um, and through that work, they generate awareness about health policy in this area. And building on the outputs from previous engagements with patients, and including this thinking, the first IPOSI citizens jury took place in April last year, 2021. Um, and that was to deliberate on access to health information and how that might work. And four ADAPT um, academics who work in this area were on the oversight panel for the jury. Um, and at that jury, 25 citizens shared their perspectives on who they might be comfortable with accessing their health information and for what purposes. So just to, to give an overview of the process. Um, so, um, Sorry. Yeah. So to give an overview of the process, how did we go from um, thinking about the question for the citizens jury and, you know, the question for the jury was about access to health information. And we wanted to kind of step, take a step back from that and explore what is my health information. And to do that, we we thought about who the target audience for a thinking like this might be. Um, and we came up with the general public and also um, patient groups. So we um, we invited patient groups to come to co-creation workshops and um, that were facilitated by the researchers. 
Um, and from these from these workshops with small group discussions, a number of outputs or themes on the topic um, came about. These are were developed into scenarios, and I'll go through this in a bit more information or in a bit more detail in a minute. But the scenarios um, were developed from these workshops, um, and the we then follow up with participants to ensure that the scenarios and their contributions are are represented. These scenarios then form the basis for the event discussions and uh, ultimately the insights from the thinking discussions feedback to the research. So this is this is your typical um, thinking thinking process. So um, to go into just a bit more detail on how that process worked in terms of what is my health information. Um, so as I mentioned, ADAPT researchers in health informatics have, have long established working relationships with these groups and the, the participants were recruited through these networks. In total, nine people participated in a co-creation workshop, which was held on Zoom in back in February to the February 2021. Um, and this was to explore the question, what is my health information? So during the workshop, small group discussions were used to draw from patients' expertise and experience to identify themes related to the question. Um, the Padlet tool was used to record notes um, that were taken into small discussion groups and a whole group discussion at the end brought together the two discussions and the themes identified through this workshop were subsequently analyzed and considered for inclusion in the scenarios and then used at the subsequent citizens thinking i'm just wondering could i pause a second i'm really sorry about this <laughs> but uh, i think i'm using um I think I'm using um, an old version of my my slides. Um, so if you wouldn't mind if I just. Um, That's no problem. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick up there on the. Um, the the Padlet slide. OK, can everybody see that again? Yes. yes. Thanks. OK. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, we used Padlet, the tool Padlet, um, to record the notes um, that were taken during two small group discussions. And then a whole group discussion at the end brought these two discussions together. Um, and the themes, the themes that we identified were subsequently analysed by the, the researchers and considered for inclusion in the scenarios. And we, I mentioned before that the co-creation process is iterative. So once these scenarios were finalised, um, a follow-up meeting was then held with the co-creation participants. Um, and this was to discuss the scenarios and ensure that their contributions where they were included were accurately represented. And um, so as a result of these discussions, uh, we ended up with two different scenarios for the thinking. So Sarah's story centers around the accuracy of the health information that we collect, we collect ourselves using our devices. So our phones now can track things like our sleep patterns, our heart rate, our breathing and our movement. And this gives us an element of control over our health data that we mightn't have had before without specialist um, specialist machinery. And in this scenario, um, participants are invited, so Sarah's scenario, participants are invited to discuss the accuracy of the information that, um, the accuracy of the information that, that Sarah might collect herself. And the, the discussion um, looked at it from the points of view of the patient, of Sarah, and also of her doctor. Barney's story then was the second scenario that emerged from this um, this thinking, and um, that looks at 
who can access our health information. So again, with the use of new technologies, you know, that we use ourselves, but also within the health system, um, concerns are growing about who's able to, to view and use this information. And um, all the while it remains very hard for us to access this information ourselves. Um, so participants um, who talked about this scenario um, discussed the consequences of accessing or the, the kind of the re restriction of access to, to their health information. Um, so this slide, uh, just before I go on to some of the insights from the thinking, this slide shows um, some of the key numbers around, around the thinking. So altogether 13 ADAPT members were involved in the, the planning, um, the content development, and also as scribes and facilitators in this event, and um, along with three other collaborators including a patient representative from vasculitis Ireland um, and these uh, all of the these collaborators along with the the adapt members were um, a key part of this thinking organizing team um, and I suppose just on this slide just to highlight that um, the the thinkings um, the amount of time that it takes to develop the the content and design and deliver the the thinking, so this thinking in particular, was a lot more than we'd originally anticipated. And um, you can see there, there was a total of 199 hours that went into that. Um, so it's, it, it, I suppose, one of the key takeaways from, from this process was that it's important to ensure that, you know, the that there's a motivation for doing a thinking like this. Um, and you know that there's a specific purpose for doing it because it is quite a bit of work. And um, so the just to move on. Um, so at the health information thinking, um, the scenario discussions yielded insights into the public sentiment around health information which was then taken into consideration when preparing for the citizens jury that I mentioned earlier, which deliberated on the topic of access to health information. And the, the aim of our thinking was to consider the question, what is my health information? And some of the key points or outputs are summarized here. And you can see that, you know, there is some of the, um, the scenario topics came out in the in the the final key points um you know around controlling access that the information should be should be correct and that you know people should have confidence in the information that's um that's being gathered on them um <clears throat> so just to move on the next slide is in terms of the the value for the researchers and um, so Laura already outlined the evaluation results in details but um, these were some of the areas that our researchers got value from being involved in this process and um, so in terms of you know linking in with regulation so the outputs from the thinking this thinking in particular facilitated further conversations between ADAPT and HICWA based on HICWA's work um, on the development of a, a consent model for accessing health information and also um, facilitated conversations with the between ADAPT and the HSE um, and just at the, the final part that was of value for the researchers, um, so the as part of this thinking, the patient representatives um, who, par who participated in the organizing group and in the co-creation, um, they were reimbursed for their time in accordance with best practice and public engagement. Um, and the co-creation group was provided with an opportunity um, to kind of view the scenario development process and then to participate in the thinking ultimately. Um, and, and the researchers feel that that, that goes towards fostering, um, fostering a, a research infrastructure which values meaningful engagement with patients and citizens. Um, and then just uh, this slide summarizes um, the the kind of 
the outcomes from the thinking and the outcomes from the the citizens jury the iposi citizens jury and um, so this kind of summarizes what i what i was um talking about already but um just to kind of sum up a citizens jury is a very long form process um also similar to a citizens assembly um a long form deliberative process whereas the citizens thinkings uh, i'm sorry just to say that um with the jury or with an assembly a lot of work goes into kind of defining what the jury mission mission would be um and we found that the thinking can be a very useful kind of a, a, a pre pre event when it comes to defining the the jury's the jury's mission. It's it's a shorter form deliver, deliberative process, and it's a bit more bespoke and a bit more flexible um, than the more formal jury process. Um, so just to move on uh just to to mention the, the kind of the evolution of the project and um where where we're going so the the previous thinking that i was talking about and um, that laura mentioned the evaluation of that was um the 2021 series um which we wrapped up at the end of 2021 uh, but thankfully we received funding through the sfi discover program um to to move kind of beyond the the researcher researcher citizen model um and to apply the quadruple helix uh, which would see which or which does see us um bringing in representatives from public authorities or government and industry as well as as well as academia and citizens and we feel that the wider stakeholder engagement will will continue to result in even more meaningful conversations about the role of ai in society um, and hopefully with greater potential to influence the emerging research and public policy in this area um, so I just have a list of our current stakeholders, our current partners that we're working with. And if you have a look down the list, you can see that we're well represented represented when it comes to kind of the civil society and community organizations um but and academia and the the academic community of course um but there's a constant challenge that we find around engaging with policymakers and industry partners and this is something that you know that we're aware of and we're always trying to kind of look at ways that we can we can engage policymakers and industry partners more in the process um so um i suppose just uh, as i start to sum up on this part um co-creation is very much at the heart of adapts thinkings and the principles of co-creation are embedded throughout the project and as the project has has evolved um i think they these principles continue to be you know to form a greater part and to underpin the whole the whole project um, by design this project actively engages stakeholders in the design the production and the iterative stages of the process um, and this involves you know co-choosing thinking topics to explore uh, co-development Developing content, including the discussion scenarios um, around tech, how AI technology is used. Um, and towards the end of the project, we're going to be um, co-creating a toolkit with the Center for Engaged Research and other project stakeholders. Um, and we are also working with an evaluation partner based in Brussels called Sticky Dot. And Sticky Dot is a collective, um, and they're working to shape research and innovation through multi stakeholder engagement and co creation. So their whole approach is around, um, around co creating. And working with Sticky Dot has been an absolutely fantastic experience for us um, in terms of learning about um, co their co-assessment approach. So how does the co-assessment approach work? Um, I'll give you an example just based on how, how we've been doing it on the project. So at the start of the project, Sticky Dot ran um, a participatory evaluation workshop 
with a panel of participants who were involved in the stakeholder engagement and co-creation process. And there was there were a range of profiles present at that workshop. Um, including citizens, uh, public engagement representatives, um, uh, representatives from the research community, as well as policy and industry. And in the workshop, we analysed um, the expected outcomes of the programme and the predefined metrics that, that we had outlined to use for evaluation, and also the project constraints in order to co-design this evaluation process with participants. And the outcomes of that were a kind of a full evaluation plan, um, including a selection of innovative tools um, that would be implemented through formative evaluation, uh, summative assessment and iterative evaluation throughout the project and just on the iterative nature so the you know sticky dot to find the or outlined the full project full evaluation plan and then went back to the participants and the stakeholders um just to you know to check that that was indeed what we had decided in that workshop and then that became became the full the full plan and i i think this type of engaged in, kind of engaged approach to evaluation is a really nice approach um and it enables us as a team um like as the say the project team the thinking project team to embed co-creation principles in you know all aspects of the delivery of this project but it also um i think has been a great learning experience for the adapt team um and how we might kind of embed these these principles you know across other adapt programs engagement programs and finally just before i hand back to laura um we just wanted to highlight some of the kind of positive stakeholder feedback that we've had on the project uh, so julie was a collaborator on the health information thinking um that i talked about earlier and robert attended one of our co-creation workshops and a subsequent thinking um, and both have since spoken at other adapt events about their experiences with the process and then Niall is a researcher um, who was involved in the, the hybrid thinking that Laura mentioned last year. The topic of that one was around smart do doorbells. And all in all, I think um, people have been finding that it's a rewarding, a rewarding process. And we find it a very rewarding process as well, despite the challenges. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Laura now, who's going to um, outline some of the challenges um, with that. So I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Emma. Uh, can you see my screen okay there? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm just going to very quickly um, share with you six key recommendations that we have um, that we wanted to share with you, uh, all arising from what we've learned over the, the course of this project, and we have learned a, a lot. <laughs> Um, you heard from Emma how co-creation has been key to the success of the project, and it really helps ensure that the thinkings attract and resonate with and are beneficial to our intended target audiences. Um, and we'd, we'd really recommend that you just don't underestimate, as we did initially, the amount of extra time and work the co-creation uh, takes. It's often an iterative process, as Emma has just outlined there, and you need to ensure that you factor in adequate time and resources uh, that, that it requires. Um, we've seen from evaluation, however, this, this kind of deep engagement with citizens provides much more useful, uh, relevant and inspiring insights for researchers um, than light touch engagement would. And from the citizens perspective, they have the opportunities to get their voices heard and understood while also having AI demystified. So definitely build co-creation into your project, but just make sure that you, you resource it adequately. Our second recommendation is that you understand and in some ways accept that many people won't turn up. Um, so we always aim to oversell tickets for events considerably. Uh, we use Eventbrite to manage registrations for thinking events. Um, and on average, we see around about a 55% drop off uh, from numbers of people who've registered for the events. We have had up to 83% drop off though, which is uh, obviously has a huge impact in terms of resources a think in um, as we can reduce down the, the number of participating researchers and the amount of catering and so on that we provide if we know in advance that we're going to have uh, lower numbers. 
Uh, and we've, of course, tried uh, various measures to try and mitigate the drop off. So, for example, we reconfirm attendance um, with public uh, registrants the day before the event. But sadly, no shows have, have just become a fact of, of hosting public events, both online and offline. Um, and I think the importance of co-creation, again, is worth highlighting here that we usually find where we partner with a community group or a patient advocacy group or so on, we have far fewer no-shows. And you really feel this is because the people linked to the organisations who've contributed to the uh, co-creation, they're much more invested in the thinking process and are, are therefore more, much more likely to show up. Our third recommendation is that you recognise contributions from uh, the stakeholders. So you're probably aware good practice guidelines um, outlined by organisations such as the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Research indicate that it really is important to recognise and acknowledge co-creation participants involvement. And for us, as Emma mentioned, this meant providing honorariums to citizens who participated in the co-creation workshops. Um, we think it's also a good idea if you're publishing insights or research, research outcomes from the project that you ask co-creation partners if they'd like to be recognised as authors or co-authors or invite them along to share your experiences at knowledge sharing events. And we recommend again that you ensure that you've budget um, factored in uh, to enable you to acknowledge your partners in such ways when you're, you're preparing a project proposal. A recommendation number four is to train researchers uh, effectively. So the thinking series involved 121 researchers from multiple academic institutions. Some of these uh, were experienced in public engagement, but many were early stage PhD students who had little or no uh, experience in this area. So we hired external training consultants to deliver training initially on aspects of facilitation skills. Uh, and then as the pandemic uh, effects hit in, we, we then moved to training on moving dialogue online. And as a result, the researchers said overwhelmingly in the external evaluation that they felt they had sufficient training and preparation uh, for the think-ins. So again, we would recommend that you ensure that you budget appropriately for the training. And it also has the, the added benefit that the, it en enhances the human capacity building outcomes of your, your project. Number five, then, is to adopt a flexible mindset. Uh, when we submitted the Citizens Thinking uh, funding proposal in 2019, little could we have known that only a few months later we'd end up delivering the project uh, as we started into a global pandemic. Uh, we initially planned to deliver the series of thinkings in person, but obviously the pandemic meant that, that was no longer possible. So we had to look to new collaborators, delivery modes and timelines for a project. And by remaining flexible and embracing the change, uh, albeit a little bit reluctantly at first, we ended up with new insights, connections and opportunities for future work that we just wouldn't have had otherwise. So uh, remaining flexible, I think, really benefited us. And finally, uh, we recommend that you leverage related campaigns and events. So we took the opportunity to piggyback uh, on or to partner with uh, some major national and international events and campaigns. And this really helped to maximise the reach and, and impact of our project. Uh, so for us, this included uh, participating in the Electric Picnic mu Music Festival, the Ars Electronica European Art, Technology and Society Festival, and the START F Festival, which we ran with uh, Trinity to coincide with the European Researchers Night. Uh, I mentioned earlier as well, we've also aligned the thinking series with the Creating Your Future National Conversation on Research in Ireland, which was run by the government last year. And this really helped to raise the profile of our, our thinking events. Um, so for us, piggybacking on or partnering like this can help deliver a, really an important multiplier effect. So as you can leverage other events or campaigns, promotion, networks, logistics, and so on. So I'm going to ha hand it back to Emma now, and she'll conclude by letting you know how you can get involved in our citizens' thinkings and some of our other education and public engagement programmes. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> Just going to share my screen again. Can everybody see that now? Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, OK, so um, you might be thinking at this stage that you want to get involved, hopefully. Um, well, on our website, if you're interested in getting involved on our website, um, we have a dedicated kind of resources page. 
And if you're interested in hosting your own thinking, um, you'll find guidelines for running a thinking. Um, there's a discussion scenario bank um, and cloud dedicated classroom resources for teachers. And it's also where you'll find our recently published white paper um, called We Need to Talk About AI, the case for citizens thinkings for citizen researcher dialogue and deliberation. And that goes um, really into a great depth around the, um, the insights from from the last year's last year's series and the resources page also contains the evaluation reports um, from 2019 and uh, 2022. Um, so ways that you can you can get involved with our current series or get involved, you can use the resources on the website and um, to develop and host your uh, thinking on your own research area. And um, this is the thinkings is a flexible format and it's worked. It's you know definitely worked for us to gain public insight into the uh, into the area of artificial intelligence, and it's also been used in the area of nanoscience. And we we believe that really it could be used to gain insights into a very wide variety of other topics you know to get get the public insight into into other topics so if you are thinking of hosting your own thinking uh just drop us um drop us an email or we can arrange a chat um Have we lost her? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out was it my <laughs> internet frozen or was it Emma's, but it's obviously Emma's. Right. Um, it, would you know, Laura, is she concluding now or? I'm pretty sure she is. Yeah. Um, so if you if you want to switch to questions, I'm sure she she realized that she has uh, that she has frozen and, and drop off yeah. and, and come back on. That's no problem. Do you have any concluding remarks before we pass over to questions? No, so just to say th thanks to everyone who stayed with us um, and I hope that it's given you an insight into what a thinking is um, and how it can be beneficial from a, a research perspective and also in terms of for um, public participants what they can get out of it. Um, it the model has worked really well for us. Um, we've been working off a relatively small budget. Um, Emma mentioned that obviously the amount of person hours and so on that has gone into them where, where we've adopted a, a co-creation approach has, has been fairly significant but we have seen the, the the benefits of that or the the researchers in particular have seen the benefits of that in terms of it uh, informing their current and their their future work and inspiring ideas for further exploration and so on um, and really just to reiterate we're very much open for conversations if, if uh, you want to attend a, a citizens thinking for example um, I don't know if Emma pops back on she I know she has some details of some upcoming thinkings um, but also as she mentioned if you're interested in hosting one uh, we're very happy to kind of do a little bit of hand holding if necessary in terms of getting you through the first one uh, and hopefully going on from there so please don't don't hesitate to reach out to us well excellent yeah no that was amazing Laura and thank you and We'll thank Emma again when she comes back. Um, we'll go straight into questions anyway. Um, what was I? Sorry, my chat box is here. Uh, we actually have a message from uh, Laura. Um, she says, you mentioned issues with engaging with industry. Have you engaged with the big players such as Meta or Google yet? Um, she says she imagined they're already engaged with the center via, via the science. But how do you feel about engaging with the partners Engaging, uh, engaging them as partners in your work. Yeah, so we're really open to this, and it's something that we're exploring at the moment. Um, and certainly, we've been working. We're currently working, actually, with Meta on the um, the research side of things. So, looking at aspects of cyberbullying and offensive content detection and so on. Um, they haven't worked with us yet on the citizens thinkings but it, it's certainly something that that we'd we'd love them to contribute to um, we've had some some big international players though um, involved in the citizens thinking series so one of the early ones that we ran in collaboration with the science gallery uh, we had a accenture labs was also heavily involved in that so it actually brought some of its own research questions um, to that thinking and it was a, a really positive experience for for both sides 
Um, and the other people who we've collaborated with very successfully was on the hybrid thinking that we ran for Science Week last year. Um, we collaborated with the Technological University at the Shannon um, in Athlone and their ATOM cluster, so Advanced Technologies and Manufacturing Cluster, um, quite a few of their industry companies, uh, member companies, worked with us on the um, on the citizens thinking there. So um, we have had quite a, quite a lot of industry uh, collaborators on the thinking series. But yeah, we, we'd be keen to have some of the the big international players more engaged with it, and I think to, to open up conversations a bit further on, on how we can take the feedback from the citizens thinkings um, and bring that into the, the industry side of things, I think would be very valuable. Okay, uh, that's excellent. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Laura, if you're, if you're still there? I take that as a no. Um, I think engaging with the big big players is, is difficult, especially in terms of Meta and Google, they're uh, monumental in size. Uh, I might add a question, just if there's no one else um, with one at the moment. Uh, no. Uh, sorry, just, just to, sorry was... just to apologise there. I, I actually don't know what happened. I just <laughs> got... <laughs> My internet went down, I think. So I'm really sorry. D Laura, did you finish for me? Or... Um, no, just to say, Emma, if you have the, the dates of the, the next couple of thinkings, it might be good to, to share them for anyone who's interested in, in coming along to an event. Yeah, yeah. So we have on the the eighth of November. I can um, pop a link into the chat anyway. But on the eighth of November, uh, we have a think in in Maynooth Public Library, and that's on um, the increased um, public surveillance um, that uses AI technology like facial recognition and so on. So that's on the 8th of November in Maynooth Public Library at six. Um, then we have a co-creation event um, around um, um, around a translation, automatic translation app for sign languages. Um, so the co-creation event for that is on the 12th of November in Deaf Village, Ireland. Um, and there'll be a follow-up thinking on the 25th of November. Um, and that will be online and it will be around the same topic. So we'll, whatever comes out of the co-creation event, um, that the, the co-creation workshop, that will be what the event on the 25th is about so we don't have to find details but it'll be around translation of the sign language app i'll pop a link in the chat to those yes yeah, so if you could put a link into the the chat and future events that'd be great yeah um we have a message from kira oh uh thank you kira uh yes everyone seems to be very interested unfortunately people are uh, heading off to to lectures and other work um, I'll just ask a quick question then, uh, if no one else has one. Uh, I just wanted to bring you back to the co-creation workshops that you have. Uh, I'm very interested with, uh, with them uh, as we are at the Centre of Engage Research. I was just wondering, is there anything you can think of off the top of your head, either talking about the case with the health information or even the, the Big Brother is watching uh, scenarios? Was there anything that was shared in the co-creation workshops that maybe you hadn't thought of before or maybe you hadn't given as much thought towards. Um, so basically I'm asking, did the public really have a strong influence at any stage in any of the, the projects that you had? Yeah, well, one example comes to mind actually on that, um, and it was the, the health um, co-creation workshop in particular. Um, and what came out of that was it was actually out of the the health information thinking um subsequently and something that came out of that was around um around the 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 notion of consent around who can access your your information and that 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 should be part of your health record also um that you know who you who you define as being able to access that and that was something that um that it, that it was you know hadn't been explored in the way that it was kind of mentioned in the in that particular thinking um so definitely definitely led to um people thinking about 
things in a certain way. And I suppose that's, you know, the beauty of kind of bringing people's lived experience um, to these discussions. Um, you know, the, there definitely will be kind of different viewpoints that can, you know, sp inspire people or, you know, spark a new line of thinking on things. So that's that's one example. But a lot of um, from from um, from the thinkings, we've noticed that even between researchers, there's been kind of collaborations grow out of the kind of the outputs of the thinkings, or you know maybe applications to different funding calls and things. So there's there's a lot you know I think getting together and talking in this way definitely um, is is a very kind of can lead to uh, fruitful outcomes. Oh yeah, oh, excellent, excellent. Um, no, engage the public is definitely gives you amazing insights. That's something you might not have thought about before at all. Uh, and do you have any ideas of um, extending the the thinking methodology to kind of outside of the STEM area? Um, have there any any thoughts on where it could be extended to? Um, I think so. We've we we're actually hoping to extend it. Um, extend it next year but still kind of within the stem remit i suppose um but we do work you know in the area of steam quite a bit with the with the education programs um and also a lot of adapts work tends to be interdisciplinary so like laura mentioned that um there's kind of social scientists you know working within adapt and um people from digital humanities and humanities backgrounds. So I think there's definitely room for that, but we don't have any kind of concrete plans um, just yet. But I think, you know, any of these kind of, you know, like what do they call them wicked problems or like big topics you know um i think i think this is this is a great format for for kind of working through those kind of complex questions um and yeah i definitely wouldn't see it just being just having a stem remit Sorry, Laura, if you wanted to come in on no, that. No, that's what I think that's it. I would have I would have answered pretty much similar to you. So yeah, I think that's a, a good response. Yeah, wonderful. Uh if no one has else has any questions, we can begin to wrap up there. Uh I don't want to hold you on for any longer than you need to be. Um all right, well, thank you very much, uh Laura and Emma, for taking time out of your day to come and talk to us. Uh it was really excellent. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Luke. Opportunity. If you'd like to uh, share any links with me or anything, I can forward them to everyone who was registered to the event. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop recording. Uh,